question. Hello, hello, hello. Can everybody hear me? Can everybody hear me? How's everybody doing tonight? Everybody's good? <laughs> and I wanted to just, uh, we we're having some technical difficulties right now and getting uh, the projector set up and we're getting microphones right now. Uh, IT guys just showed up uh, not too long ago. Uh, but we're going to move forward now and try to get started um, on this so we can have our comments heard and made. Um, but first I want to just uh, recognize a few people in the audience um, who are elected leaders that you, repre that you that represent you um, in District 22. First and foremost, my name is Alonzo Washington. I am one of your state delegates. I represent District 22 along with Delegates Tawana Gaines, uh, Anne Haley, and Senator Paul Pinsky. Please give me a round of applause. together tonight to organize this meeting uh, for you. Um, I also wanted to recognize a couple other elected officials. I did see Councilman, Vice Chair Councilwoman uh, Daniel Varos here with us tonight, and uh, Mary Lehman, who's here as well. Uh, we do have uh, Mayor Emmett Jordan, uh, Jay David, Councilman Jay Davis, Councilman Colin Bird, uh, Mayor Hanko, we have, uh, we want to give him a round of applause as your representative from Greenville. Uh, one of my colleagues, um, Eric Barron, is here with us tonight, one of the only delegates outside of our district here. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Uh, we have the former chair of the Pressures County delegation, Joey Navi, um, who is here with us too. Uh, we have mayor of University Park, uh, Lynn Curry, um, who is here. Mr. Thank you. And then, ooh, lights are working now. Can, you, can we get the IT guy a round of applause, please? Give us some motivation. <laughs> uh, and any other, I, I did see Mayor Hollingsworth uh, from the city of Hyattsville um, here. Mayor Hollingsworth. Um, so, as many of you know, I'm just going to get started. I want to thank you for coming to this open discussion uh, for this uh, maglev train um, that uh, the governor has proposed and put into action uh, thus far. Um, I wanted to just have some co opening art comments for you. Um, as you probably know by now, um, during the month of October, the Baltimore-Washington Rapid Rail, in conjunction with the Maryland Transit Administration and the Federal Railroad Administration, has hosted five public open houses. Uh, to allow public comment to various aspects of the MAGLA proposal. While two of those, while two of those meetings were here in Prince George's County, none of them were here in District 22 in our district at all, where all three of the lines will be impacted by, by our district will be impacted by. Unfortunately to this date, um, unfortunately to this date, after many times that we've requested um, the governor, um, the lieutenant governor, um, his staff, um, MTA, the Railroad Administration, the Railroad, the BWRR folks, we've asked them for weeks now to attend and host this meeting. They have refused to be here and to listen to your comments. They have ultimately refused to come here and listen. We had a meeting scheduled in November um, that they canceled on us because they did not want to hear from you. And I believe that that is the disgrace and the governor is not doing his job in, in this project, and he needs to hear from us directly. So with this, as you know, based on the proposed routes, the Magla train would have, been, would have the greatest impact in our district, which is District 22, compared to the other six legislative districts in Prince George's County. In Greenbelt, Landham, and Riverdale alone, the Magla train will directly intersect with eight public schools, seven parks and recreation facilities, 2,420 2, residences. Now, I'm a strong proponent of mass transit and innovative solutions to reduce traffic, but if this project is going to directly affect the many properties in our district, then I believe that you deserve to be informed and your voices need to be heard and seriously considered, uh, which is why we're having this meeting tonight. 
Um, I know that I know that you have not been afforded this opportunity, and I know that you have concerns over the effects of the maglev could have on Greenbelt Forest Preserve, the impacts of the noise and the vibration levels, and the unknown co cause associated with construction and operation. You deserve to have these questions answered honestly, so I have assembled my own panel of transportation experts uh, to address all of your questions regarding the maglev train uh, tonight. Um, so I will, right now we wanted to play a video, but we're not gonna do that. I wanted to play a video for you of what their presentation has been around the state so you can see and hear at least a little bit, a little bit more of the background from them. But I'm just gonna skip all of that and ask, ask our panelists to come up um, for our panelists. Uh, we have Dr. Zay Zhang, if you will come up please, uh, from the University of Maryland. Uh, uh, we have Stennis Brady to come up as well, and Bill Boone, and of course our delegate Tawana Gaines to come on up as well. I'm just going to give some background information on, uh, on these folks. Um, as you know, um, delegate, you all of you on the end. So as many of you know, many of you know Delegate Tawana Gaines. Um, she's the Vice Chair of the Appropriations Committee in the House of Delegates. Um, she's also the Chair of Transportation um, in the House as well. So any transportation issues that come up throughout the state, um, MTA, SHA, um, those, those agencies um, come through her committee for approval of any funding that comes through her committee. Um, so I will go along with, um, so from Delegate Tawana Gaines to the left, of uh, Delegate Gaines, or to the right of Delegate Gaines, if you're looking on, if you look at on the, on the um, up here, excuse me. <laughs> uh, we have Dennis Brady. Um, Dennis Brady has over 20, 42 years of experience as an electrical engineer and over 33 years of experience as a nuclear engineer. He's a U.S. Navy veteran. Mr. Brady has received degrees in electrical and nuclear engineering from North Carolina State University and Johns Hopkins University. Um, he's also served as a member of the Boyd City Council for over 21 years and has been a past president of the Maryland Municipal League and the Prince George County Municipal Association. Currently, Mr. Brady serves as the chair of the Citizens Against SC Maglev, Maglev Coalition Steering Committee. Please give another round of applause. Now, let me get this right. If you're looking on the stage to the left of W. Gaines, <laughs> is uh, Bill Boone. Uh, Bill Boone uh, has 28 years of experience in geographic information systems and 30 years of experience in emergency management. Um, he has worked in various uh, fields related to GIS, including transportation GIS, disaster response, federal law enforcement operations support, and, home, and homeland security projects. Both Bill and Dennis are active leaders in the Citizens Against the Magna Training Organization. Uh, for for a bit, then please give a round of applause. Okay, and then so we have Dr. Zhang, uh, who's here. Um, he, is, he is the Herbert Rabin Distinguished Professor of Civil Engineer and Director of the National Transportation Center at the University of Maryland College of Park. Um, um, Dr. Zhang's research focuses on innovative mobility solutions, urban sustainability, and next generation transportation modeling and decision support tools that are large scale, real time capable, and driven by big data. Got some for me? Um, Dr. Zane has published more than 250 peer reviewed papers, nine books, and book chapters, and numerous technical reports. Most recently, he served as a member of the White House OSTP NEC. The external panel on President Obama's 21st Century Clean Transportation System and the Magla and the Maryland State Transportation Innovation Council. Please give the doctor a round of applause. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna we're gonna um, as many of you know, as I told you earlier, MTA and BWRR decided to not be here. So these folks are going to do their best to explain to us. You know, tell us a little bit about the background of the of the maglev train, and tell us how one um, the citizens that gets uh, the maglev uh, defeated it in other areas, and then also um, just give us a little bit of background about what they do and how we can work together to um, to make sure that this uh, does not impact our communities greatly. Thank you. 
Thank you for having this uh, forum or an open hearing on this. Uh, and thank you for having uh, Bill and myself here to represent the citizens we've been working on this since, um, I guess we formed in, in May uh, to oppose the, the MAGLEV. In April, they had, MPA had the uh, first round of open houses at the end of their scoping phase. And the scoping phase asked people, asked citizens and residents and businesses and other people what issues they should look at when they do the environmental studies. And the two people that started this group, Aviva Nabisky and Lori Thompson, were shocked when they went to the Bowie open house and there were 16 people that showed up. Out, and when they looked at the original map, they had six routes that devastated in Ronald County and Prince George's County, and they were horrified. And they started asking their neighbors, and no one knew about it. So we started working, came together, and the first impetus that, that drove us was uh, the city of Bowie, the city council of Bowie, had a briefing by uh, Dave Henley, the project manager for Baltimore, Washington, <coughs> Rapid Rail, BWRR, on July 10th. And we spent the end of May through the beginning of July preparing for that. And we had a rebuttal program that we uh, provided information that, that challenged some of what they were suggesting. They're, they're proposing a high-speed levitation train that would go from uh, Baltimore to Washington in 15 minutes with top speed of 311 miles per hour. They talk about the route going, ultimately going from Washington to New York and your ability to travel to New York in less than an hour. And their ultimate goal is to go from Charlotte to Boston using a magnet, which they claim to be a new technology, when in fact it's about 30 years old. It's old technology already. And in order to do this, they need to create new infrastructure. So we started to organize. Our group started in, in July. We had about 60 people on our Facebook. Our Facebook is called Citizens Against SC Magma. And we used the membership as an indicator of the strength of our group. In July, mid-July, four months ago, we had less than 60 people in members. And earlier today when I looked, we had 2,722 people. All of that growth has occurred. All of that growth has occurred through word of mouth by having people talk to their neighbors. And that's what we encourage everyone to do. In the fight against this, it's important to register your concerns, you know, list your complaints about lack of notification, raise issues that you uh, feel are important. I saw a sign over here about keep it wooded. Hold it up. That's a good point. The, uh, Transition made from above ground to below ground for the west, BW, BW Parkway West goes to a great wooded area. You need to be specific when you write to uh, MTA, write to uh, Federal Railroad, listing your complaints, asking that you be made, put on the uh, official record. But you need to, if you just write and say, I think it's a dumb idea, you know, they'll, they'll accept your letter. And they'll put it in a little hopper. They'll put it in a hopper and they'll say, noted. But if you write and say, you know, on this wooded area, the city of, uh, of, of Rico uh, planned years ago to preserve this, and that's wrong, they're going to look into that. If you know of a historic property and you identify it, they will look into it. And they're required to respond and investigate every issue and complaint and what have you. The scoping phase ended. We, we maintain that it was not properly done and it should be reopened. Their response is, it's over, but we will continue to include new issues as they are identified. So it's important to stay informed and important to, to stay connected with this and write to those people at Federal Railroad and at uh, MTA that are doing the environmental study. But it's more important that whenever you write a letter to them, copy your elected officials. They need to know what your thoughts are when you contact them, so they can act on your behalf too. Um, we, I told you that first open houses at Bowie had 16 people. 
the October open house in, in, at Bowie State had almost 800 people show up, and there wasn't a single uh, person that made a favorable comment on the pro project. Uh, the Laurel High School had nearly 500, and the Anne Arundel High School had almost 500. So the turnout for the second round was much, much better. And I think they're now getting the, the strong message that this is a project that is not wanted. Uh, I'll, I'll answer questions or what have you. That's kind of a synopsis of, of where we are today, but I will pass it on to Oh, Okay. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate it. Just a couple of quick announcements um, that we've received from the building uh, supervisor here. Um, we do have two cars that could possibly be towed if you're towed, uh, if you are parked uh, illegally. So if you believe you're parked illegally, please go, check, go move your car. And of course, as you know, we have still more information packets that you can take out as you go. But I wanted to make sure that no one gets their car towed today. And once you get back home safely. Thank you very much. Yeah, I wonder why the Alonzo asked me to be here. And then I remembered, I do appropriations. <laughs> and I've been known for uh, fancy budget language. Uh, this project has never been presented to the General Assembly. I think the only thing they said was that it was a private project. I believe they got $26 million from the federal government. My belief is that federal money has to flow through the state, and that's why uh, NTA is involved. Uh, Delegate Healy and I plan to have a uh, briefing as soon as session starts next year. We'll be sure to invite every single last one of you. Uh, we'll use the joint hearing room so that there's plenty of space for everyone to have an opportunity to, to listen. As I said, I do appropriations. This would be a policy issue. So I know that Delegate Healy and Senator Pinsky are working on ideas to come up with a legitimate ways of slowing the project down, if not altogether stopping it. I remember back in, oh, I'm going to say 2002, 2003, this was a project that uh, somehow was making its way through the General Assembly. And we were able to put, a, put the brakes on it on, on the uh, conference committee on a, which is made up of five members from the Senate and five members from the House. Uh, two of those members, the project would have gone right through their district, so that was a no. And I was one of the members who uh, agreed. It wasn't coming to Prince George's County, not coming through this district at that time. But um, we stopped it then, and my belief is that mm, we'll be able to stop it again.
have photos that will go to the outlines. You will see all of the maps that have been done up and down the line, and we're going to be adding more of those that will show different types of analysis in the coming months. Thank you. Uh, hi, good evening. And again, my name is uh, Lei Zhang. I'm a professor of transportation engineering and a director of the National Transportation Center at the University of Maryland. Uh, we are very proud to be the flagship university of the state and the backyard university of the Prince George's County. Uh, we are very appreciative of the support that the Prince George's County and its community has offered to the university. So when Dedicated Washington staff contacted us earlier to see if we can be here, uh, have conversations, and potentially answer questions to this community about this particular MACLA project. I said, hey, you know, we're very happy to be here. Uh, as the state's flagship public university, uh, we can uh, we, we not only uh, cannot take sight on um, a project unless we have thoroughly started it, uh, but at a university we have some world-class expertise on related topics and study areas including electric magnetivity, uh, the propulsion technology, both from maglev and hyperloop, and we have done a lot of previous research and studies on high-speed rail in general, as well as its community impact. So I'm just very happy to be here uh, to share what we know about the project and to be happy to answer any questions uh, from this community. Uh, it's just great to see elected officials and community members get together to discuss a topic of clear importance to this community. And we from the University of Maryland are just happy to, uh, to be here. And, and so in terms of my personal experience with the maglev technology, and it always started from uh, probably many of you and or your kids have taken physics classes, and when you drop, when you drop a very strong magnet across a steel tube, it takes a long time for that magnet to actually drop to the ground because the maglev levitation caused in terms of the interaction between the magnet and electricity fields, uh, the magnet field generated electricity. So that's the very technology that actually support the maglev train. So it does not really touch the track, so it basically floats on the track. The SAM, <laughs> the, the, the SAM electromagnetic field power really propels and stops the train. So the main difference between the magnet technology and the traditional a wheel based. Um, maybe I, I'm actually uh, pretty loud. Maybe I can just speak a little bit louder than that. Um, is, um, is that it doesn't have wheels. And so the first magnet project that actually put into commercial operation is actually a 19 mile long segment of maglev train between the Shanghai airport and the city center. Uh, the top speed is 400 kilometers an hour, which is about 250 miles per hour. Riding the train is an impressive experience, but the community impact is very complex. Um, so if, if there are questions I can answer here directly today, I'll be very happy to do so. And we also have a lot of experts at the university next door. So if there are questions that um, take their expertise to answer, I will also be happy to pass on these questions to my colleagues at the University of Maryland, and then give the answers to dedicated Washington staff uh, who can then pass on that answer back to the community. Uh, it's just very, uh, I'm very, very pleased to, to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to have our, our other state officials, delegates Haley and uh, Senator Pinsey, come up and just say a few words uh, about the project and their, from their perspective and their vantage points um, in the state legislature. And you all can please give Senator Paul Pitsky a round of applause as you see. Uh, thank you all. Uh, before I say a few words, 
you know, the 22nd District wanted to embark on this activity to give an opportunity for you folks, but uh, Alonzo took the lead on pulling this together, and I think we all thank Alonzo for doing this. Let me ask you a question. In the last three months, how many of you have utilized the Metro? Raise your hand if you've utilized the Metro. Okay, look around. I'd say it's about half the audience. Put your hands down. In the last three months, how many of you have used the Acela train to New York? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly the issue in front of us. Do we want to have a system that gets people to work, leaves cars at home, or do we want to have a very high cost train that has small utilization? This is misplaced priorities. I don't have a PhD in engineering or in mapping. Hopefully I have an equivalent in politics. Um, at least I put in a few years on it. Um, maybe an ABD, uh, all, all the dissertation. But the point is, we have an underfunded metro system. And the administration, the government has been... And the governor has been unwilling to commit to a revenue stream to make sure Metro is on firm foundation, literally and figuratively. You know, there needs to be upgrades, it's got to be economically sound. And a lot of the other jurisdictions are saying, Maryland, you've got to kick in. And he's been unwilling to do that. And thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of people utilize Metro to get to work, to keep the economy running. But now we're being asked to take on a project between Baltimore and Washington, which, you know, a cell is a couple hundred dollars. Who knows how much this would be? I mean, who would use it? Maybe bankers, maybe some elected officials. That's it. It wouldn't benefit the working and middle income people of this region at all, or the Baltimore region. It's about politics. And as Alonzo said earlier, I mean, there's mass transit and there's mass transit. When tens of thousands of people are using it on a regular basis, and you can avoid cars and greenhouse gas emissions, that's mass transit. We should support it. having a strong metro system here and involved in all the major cities. But yet, we're being told to buy into this mag left. And even the governor occasionally says, well, it's mass transit. Yet, yet, almost in the same month, he recommends adding lanes to the Baldwin Washington Parkway, to the Beltway, and to Route 270 so there can be more cars going between Baltimore and Washington. It's a scam and it's politics. It's not about science, it's about politics. Now, I'm not an expert in, in all the routine and, and the underpinnings, and it's, it's being used in Japan. Japan, they have a similar system, not in Maglev, but a bullet train in, in France and places in Europe. But to think that that's where we should be spending our time, energy, and money is simply ludicrous. You know, that it comes up in election year is another reason this comes up. Now, the, the, the federal EPA uh, grant is fairly significant, $40 million? 27.2 okay. million, and they say, well, that's a lot of money to help us get started. The cost of this, as you'll hear, is in the billions, maybe tens of billions of dollars. Now they're saying private interests from Japan and other countries are, are going to underwrite this. But you can be sure, if it doesn't make the mark, it will fall on Every one of you in this room. They have not made a legitimate argument for doing this other than for political expediency. So um, I can't give you the expertise which you'll be able to ask these gentlemen and women, um, but I think it is a, a political morass that we don't want to pursue, uh, and we have to make our priorities right, and that's having a strong metro system, and we shouldn't be talking about MagLev until that's done. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm uh, on a, the policy committee that deals with transportation and the environment. And 
to what is correct, the governor didn't announce this to the general. So he never came to us during the session. He never sent us word uh, at all. It was seems to have been trying to get done under the radar. Well, I really appreciate the work of all the citizens who stayed on top of it and really woke everybody up about it. And they're right. The, I went to the um, open house at Bowie State University. There were a lot of people there, and they had a lot of legitimate questions. But you would have to walk around and find the right person to ask your question. And they were there, but they were like in this big crowd of people, and they weren't designated as this is where you go to talk to somebody about this or that. And there was no back and forth like an audience. And that's what Alonso has tried to put together. He invited them, but they didn't come, and then they refused to come. So what Tawana and I have done, as she mentioned, we're, we are, our two committees, the, on the funding side and on the policy side, are gonna bring the transportation agencies before us and ask them, what are they really thinking about doing? What is this? Is this just press releases? Because some people think that's what it is. Is this just like politics? Some people that think, is this actually something anybody's really, truly considering? Well, somebody's spending $27 million to study this. So the Federal, High, the Federal Railroad Administration is serious about it, and we have to be serious about it too, and we are going to be serious about it. And as a person on the policy committee, I've been researching the legalities of, because the first thing that I heard from my constituents, the people when I went to community meetings, in different, all different parts of our district, was about the issue of eminent domain. Are they going to be able to take somebody's home and clear it out of the way so that they can build this thing? It looks like that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about going underground for most of the, most of the place where the houses are. But we don't know the impact that's going to have on what's above it. We don't know. I, mean, I grew up in Pennsylvania. I grew up in coal mine country. I know what it is to be under. I don't want that to happen to people in our community. And I certainly don't want a railroad company to be able to condemn people's homes so that they can build something. And I'm going to put on the first day of the session, it's my intention to drop a bill to remove that power from the railroad companies. That has existed in Maryland since the first railroad was built back in the 1830s, when they built the very first railroad in the United States, was in Maryland, it's the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. And that, they got all kind of special treatment at the time so that they could build that. And it's been on the books for hundreds of years and it's been a sleepy thing because nobody, they haven't tried to use it recently. People are awake now. And I'm, I, I expect that this is going to be a hot topic in the coming session. And we're gonna keep it that way. We're gonna keep light and heat on it. And we will be announcing when that public hearing is so that as many people as want to can come down and listen. We are your representatives. They wouldn't come to talk to you. They're going to come to talk to us and we're going to ask those questions. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you, Delegates uh, Haley and Senator Pinsky. Really appreciate you all you know, your remarks. Um, so we're just going to ask a couple of a few questions. Currently, as you all know, um, just, to, just to summarize where we are currently, um, they started, there, there, was a four, there was a $27 million grant provided from the federal government to MTA uh, to conduct their environmental impact assessment uh, for between Baltimore and Prince George's counties. Um, and right now, um, they are going to have a preliminary um, a, a report due in January. Um, and that report is gonna talk about some of the assessments that they had, but I'm gonna ask, uh, I'm gonna ask Mr. Brady to just give a little bit of background on the environmental assessment that's currently happening or impact study that's currently happening. Uh, certainly. Um, this is all driven by the, the NEPA process, which is the Federal National Environmental Protection Act. And the, this dictates what they have to look at, what they have to evaluate uh, when it comes to uh, 
whether the project is doable or not. And our NEPA expert also points out the fact that while the end result of the report could be negative, they can still decide to move forward with it if they believe they can uh, remediate or minimize the impact that are identified through the process. So just because it gets a bad score doesn't necessarily mean it, it uh, doesn't move forward because that's a decision that's made. Uh, and the problem, actually, the last time Maglev was, was uh, here about a decade ago, part of the problem was they did not come up with a final record of, of opinion on the position. They just set it aside some. So that had they previously said, no, Maglev is doable in this region, we wouldn't be going through this right now in all likelihood. But it is driven by the, the federal government. If they look at uh, various aspects of, of environmental impact that this has, um, on historic properties, on, on uh, fish and wildlife, on, on other things that require to look at it. Now our understanding from the second round of open houses of that $27.6 million grant that they got from the federal government, and it, in the wording, when Federal Railroad posted in the Federal Register, it was limited to three locations in the, in the East Coast, the Pittsburgh area, the Chattanooga, Tennessee area, and Baltimore, Washington, and it was done with the intent of establishing a maglev. So part of the NEPA process requires the comparison of this new project to all other possible alternatives. And this is a point that we argued with them and we challenged them on this. The problem is in the Federal Registry posting, they excluded Excella and Amtrak as a possible viable alternative. So they aren't preparing to see if upgrades to Amtrak could accomplish the goal because the goal is to build that. So we have a contradiction there with regards to the NEPA process because they are purposely excluding a, a, a viable, what we believe is a very viable process. Now of that grant, we understand that $6 million is being spent on environmental studies, the rest of the money is being, and that's being done by the state, by the contractors for the state, independent of the proponents, BWRR. The remainder of the money is going to BWRR to actually design the, the, uh, the system. And their first round of, of maps were rather vague, didn't have much detail. We collected that and, and in Linthicum, uh, BWR representative said, now, there are some maps out there that are unofficial. You should only look at the ones that are on our site because the other ones are, have errors on them. So when I spoke, I raised my hand and said, I'm very proud of the maps that we did, and they're much better than what they did. <laughs> we are getting ready to put out new maps here shortly for in, in the final stages where we have taken their three current routes, the BW Parkway East, BW Parkway West, and the Amtrak route, and we are, based upon a Federal Railroad study of 2012, 2012, it's on noise and vibration of maglev trains. And we're going to be putting up, uh, take their proposed routes, and we're gonna add the distance for the vibration and add the distance for noise especially above ground, the noise is, is uh, interesting. Those will be pushed out on our website very shortly. But the, the whole process is, uh, and, and you, you mentioned you thought January was was when we, we understood, and I thought we were told at the, at the uh, open houses that it's been pushed back to late next year or the following January. So they've got a lot to do. Uh, by law, they only give us 30 days once they finish the report, they give us 30 days to review it, not us, but everyone. The open comment period is 30 days. We've already asked for 45, and we may be, depending upon how thick it is, we may ask for 60 or even 90. Uh, that's gonna be a big fight that we'll have when they finally put it. But uh, Brandon Bratcher, the uh, contact point at Federal Railroad at, I know at the Laurel High School open house, he said that it's already been pushed back and it's not going to be the end of next calendar year, maybe January of 19 that they're talking about it coming out. So we've got, we've got some time to, to fight this even more. 
so that they're, they're in the process based upon, it's kind of an iterative process because at the open houses, they showed the, the maps, but they didn't have the information about the substations. They didn't have any information about any of the ventilation or emergency access uh, hatches and path, uh, uh, passes for that. Uh, they lacked a lot of detail, and they need that to feed into the environmental because without knowing the extent of the system, exactly where it routes through, you don't know if it's going to damage where it goes underground. Is it going to have an impact on the aquifers up down here and up in, uh, especially up in the Baltimore area? Um, you don't know what impact it will have to, say, the types of wildlife or, or things like that. So it's an iterative process as they become more specific in the design that can be uh, more detailed in the analysis. Uh, and the one disappointing part of what they've done, uh, and, and um, Bradley Smith, I think it is, of MTA stated that they cannot do any economic analysis until they get down to the single route. And we challenge that, we believe that, yes, there's going to be uniqueness associated with either of the three routes that are selected, but the starting point's going to be the same, the ending point's going to be the same, and the mileage is going to be very similar, so they should be able to start the economic analysis. So they're not even, they've stated and benefited that they wanted to start the economic analysis until after they get down to the single route proposed. So we've got some challenges. We are suspicious about what's going on. I think we see some of the political influence going on, so it, it's uh, problematic on our part. Uh, I'm going to pass this off to this one, but I've got one, one thing. Write this down. Let me give you my email address. Because if you have any questions after this, or if you want us to come to your group and speak, shoot me an email, put in the subject matter, SC Maglev, and I'll get back to you. But it's Kathy with a K, K A T H Y, the letter N as in November, Dennis, D E N N I S, at Verizon.net. It's my wife's name, Ann, letter N. My name at Verizon.net. Kathy and Dennis at Verizon.net. SC Maglev in the title line and ask what you want. Give me your contact information. We'll get back to you. And we'd be more than happy, Bill and I and other members of our group, to come and speak to your groups if you like. Thank you. Uh, so I know there's going to be. Thank you. Give him a round of applause. Sure. Uh, I know there's a lot of questions out in the room, and folks want to speak up on this on this issue and ask us some questions. Um, but I'm just going to, uh, um, we do have Matt out here, Matt, you want to raise your hand? Um, he's going to come around uh, to you, so raise your hand and he'll come to you um, and give you an opportunity to speak and to ask a question. Uh, we do, we do want to limit the question to a minute to 30 seconds, 30 seconds to a minute, uh, just so we can give them a proper opportunity to answer the questions for you. And, um, and we're going to go around the room until they kick this out. Um, so what I do want to what I do want to ask, and Matt, you can come to this to this group right, right over here. But I do want to ask uh, Dr. Jane uh, a question. If you could just speak a little bit to the community impact of these uh, of these uh, of the central magnetic levitation lines. I know you say it varies, and it's very difficult to difficult uh, to, 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 to I guess to assume what it would be. But can you can you just talk a little bit about, about the noise, vibrations? things of that nature that um, folks probably will want to know about. I mean, I know they're considering taking these lines underground um, uh, over 150 feet or more or whatever that is. Maybe you just speak to that a little bit, the impact, that'd be great. Uh, sure, uh, I'll be happy to uh, do that. Uh, but hopefully, but without taking too much time, I want to follow up uh, on the environmental impact study because these are the very issues that, uh, and, comprehensive environmental impact study is supposed to address, including the ones that Daddy Washington just mentioned. Uh, and also the typical questions from the communities about the impact on noise, vibration, and because it's maglev, it tend to be high, could be high speed uh, based on what, what I read about it. Uh, so the air turbulence, then certainly impact on property values, as well as economic development. Uh, on communities and all these different things, and, and natural resources, wildlife, and habitats, ecosystems, and all these different things. And the current alignment does have both tunneled segments as well as above ground segments. And one thing I want to say is that 
Maglev, as some have has already mentioned, that is not entirely new technology, but it is new to the United States. Uh, the concept was developed several decades ago, and as I mentioned, the first commercial operation started 13 years ago uh, in Shanghai, China. Then other places have proposed it, but there, it is also a technology that's evolving very quickly. So we, for instance, more recently that has also been actually implemented maglevs that uses a uh, slower speed or moderate speed magnet technology that, that does not shoot for 250 or 300 miles per hour that operates more around 80, 100 miles per hour that it make its impact. So without knowing the exact technology that they're going to put in, into the place, it's hard to, you know, hard to put numbers on it. But in general, the noise level has a lot to do with the speed of the train and how far away you are from the train. So the operating speed has an impact on the train. For instance, if a maglev train, typical maglev train operates at its high end of the speed range, around 250 or 300 miles per hour, uh, it's almost like you are standing right next to a uh, big 80 wheeler uh, truck, uh, a big truck right next to you, running right, right past you. But if it's operating only at 200 kilometers per hour or 140 miles per hour, uh, it's probably more like uh, your next door neighbor you know, mowing his lawn in, in, in his or her backyard. You know, there is quite a, some difference, the noise level, depending on the speed of train when it passes a community. Then in terms of economic impact on property values or jobs, who gets the benefit is also important. Um, there has been a lot of documentation of what's referred to as the tunnel effect of high-speed rail project. It doesn't matter if it's maglev or tradi more traditional technologies. So if there is a station in a community, it, it tends to have a very significant positive impact on property value and businesses. You know, I, I think everyone understands that just based on you know, how much it takes to rent an apartment, depending on how close it is to a metro station. But if a community is only you know, getting passed by by a train, then uh, the impact is you know, probably less. Uh, in terms of the positive impact, is much less compared to that if a community is close to the station itself. So it, it depends. So the alignment, so it's, I think it's great that this community is trying to get more information on the actual alignment and station design of the route. And I think when that comes out, then it'll be probably more clear as to what the direction of impact uh, would be. Uh, but there are a lot of issues like operating costs that many have mentioned. Uh, it is not, typically not a cheap project to build. That is why it's you know, not everywhere around the world. And the operating cost is also a factor. Uh, usually the energy cost, so this thing takes a lot of electricity for those of you who really care about, who cares about environment. And so it depends on the source of electricity generation. Um, so you know, two thirds of its operating costs come from the energy it takes to run these trains and the rest come from maintenance as well as uh, the, the staffing and all the support going to the system. So, so I'll stop right there and I'll be happy to answer any more specific questions about impact of the community or other aspects of the technology itself. So you know, I'll try to do my best to provide the you know, objective information on the technology to this community. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, so we have a question. Yeah, sure. Yes. Uh, you want to you say your name and then maybe the city that you're from? Yes. I'm Scott Snell from Green Valley. My questions, I have two of them for you, Dr. Zhang. Uh, one of them is, uh, you mentioned about noise. As you may see from the map here, the entrance to the tunnel is relatively close to Greenbelt in some of these uh, uh, possible routes. And uh, entering and exiting uh, uh, the uh, tunnel at high speed could presumably cause a lot of uh, noise, creating a, a loud sound. Uh, I'm thinking of the West Hyattsville Metro station on the Green Line. There was some trouble in the community. I think they slowed the trains now so that when they enter and exit, it doesn't cause that shock wave uh, quite so much. But, I wonder if you could speak on that. And then my other question is, my understanding is that um, a maglev system works best in a straight line, essentially. And yet this is a curved one, I guess, for right-of-way purposes. I wonder if you might have some 
come, and I, I assume they've made some sort of compromise on a pure engineering um, route that would go straight from Union Station up to BWI and not follow the, the curve of uh, the BWI. Anyway, thank you. Uh, sure, I'll be, I'll be happy to uh, you know, take a first step on it and uh, invite all you know, my fellow panelists to, to chime in afterwards. So to answer your last second question first, in terms of the, just look at engineering side of it, engineering design side of it, uh, Maglev does have some uniqueness or it is different from real based technology. And in you, you specifically asked the question about the radius requirement, minimum radius requirement, which is a very important design uh, parameter for real systems. So this is when the train makes a turn, uh, follow the track at a specific speed. Uh, if we need to make a turn or change the direction of the movement, what is the minimum radius that needs to be designed? Uh, but in, in that regard, uh, Maglev, because it uses a very different propulsion and stopping, braking technology, it actually has a relatively smaller, requir smaller radius requirement. So it does, uh, in theory, in theory, it offers some advantage in terms of that you can use a smaller radius at the same operating speed, and then you can use a higher grade, uh, you, you can tolerate a higher grade uh, levels than a typical wheel-based technology at high speed. Uh, so these are some of the pros of the technology from an engineering design point of view. Uh, I don't have the background information on the specific alignment design or real track alignment design, geometric design, has in this community. Uh, but these are just some of the engineering, the typical engineering features of the technology. Now, in terms of the noise, as you mentioned, I think you are aware, already aware, the speed makes a big difference, makes a significant difference operating, and also the design of the tunnel, uh, certainly also the entrance of the tunnel also should make a, a difference. And, and, and in this regard, I really do not have an example that I can cite for you the entire commercial operation, op commercially operated maglev train line in Shanghai is all above ground on an elevated infrastructure. It does not actually, uh, has a tunnel as far as I know it. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, so it depends on the design, but unfortunately, you know, I do not have an example that I can refer to you on whether the noise has become an issue at the tunnel entrance of a maglev technology. Thank you. Um, thank you. We have another question right over here. So you want to introduce yourself and where you're from? Hi, I'm John Colson, speak from Mount Greenville. I have a couple questions. One of them is, do we know what the minimum distance uh, of the tunnel is relative to the ground level? Uh, the second thing I'd like to know more about is um, underground, I mean, uh, ground is more of a transmitter of, uh, of sound and vibration than air is. And I'm kind of wondering, um, you know, for ground vibrations, what the distance, what the impact area for that would be. And uh, lastly, uh, I'm reminded of an earthquake that we had here um, a number of years ago. And I'm wondering what tunneling does in terms of uh, making us more prone to uh, fractures and uh, disruption and uh, shock, uh, shock waves or from, uh, from an earthquake. Great questions. <laughs> Uh, do we have any responses? Thank you, Mr. Brady. The, uh, to answer the part of the question about the vibrations, in the Federal Railroad Administration paper that we're using, they provide uh, information specific to the maglev for uh, groundborne vibrations. It depends on the type of soil and how well that the soil, I believe it has to do with how compacted the soil is and, and what composes the soil, as to how efficient of a transmitter of the vibrations it is. So uh, we will be able to address that using a conservative estimate for that. Any other responses? Okay. Uh, do we have another question? What about the minimum distance of the tunnel? Oh, 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 right, right, right. Sorry about that. Thank you. 
these two part questions go. It was actually a three part, but it wasn't. Um, at the beginning of the summer, middle of the summer, BWRR was saying that the uh, tunnels would be 60 to 90 feet down. More towards this fall, they started saying the tunnels would be 100 to 100 feet down. So we don't really know. We do know, based on the uh, some diagrams that they have provided, uh, that the approximate diameter of the tunnel from the inside wall to the other inside wall is 43 feet. Um, what we don't know right now is how thick are the walls and is there other material here yeah. on the outside of the wall. You know, so it could be anywhere, you know, the complete tunnel width, you know, anywhere from 46 to 50, 55 feet. So again with that, at the bottom of the tunnel is 100 feet down, that means it's 50 feet below your house if you do not have a basement. So and, and one of the things that we're going to be doing is, excuse me? Can, 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 can you repeat that statement again? So the, the, the question was how to, uh, how are they going to dig this? They have mentioned that they're going to be using uh, boring machines that will do the tunneling down in. And I'm sure at some point when uh, come, the tunnels are coming up out of the ground, they're going to have to, you know, do the trench and fill because it won't be efficient to use the boring machine to some extent. So, uh, one of the things that we're going to be doing uh, for MAPS is we're going to be uh, figuring out and we're working with a uh, physicist to work out the mathematics, make sure that we've got them correctly, that we understand them so that they can be mapped, is we'll figure out what is the horizontal distance it takes the train to reach a certain depth. So an example is it'll take between uh, 1,200 to 1,300 feet of horizontal distance to reach a bottom of the tunnel depth of about 100 feet. So that means that after 1,200 to 1,300 feet, that, at that point, if you do not have a basement, then they're about 50 feet below your house. But something else we're going to be using is we have digital elevation models for the GIS. So we can take into account the elevation of the, of the surface. And as far as the fault line goes, um, you know, I don't think they're going to be going deep enough to where it's going to cause any issues for, you know, that might bring on an earthquake. However, if there is an earthquake, it, it could cause issues for the tunnel. I guess it depends a lot on uh, what they construct it on. So. Thank you. Uh, next question. Gary Stone, I live in Cleaverfield.org. Uh, there are currently three route alternatives, uh, each of which is somewhat underground, and other uh, stretches are uh, above ground. And uh, in our neighborhood, they're above ground. So my question is, at what point can we raise issues about there being alternatives to the alternatives? In other words, if we're saying in layman's terms, we like this, uh, we like this uh, west route to be underground, does that require the creation of That's a good question. The, the evaluation of alternatives is driven by their analysis, if you will. The, the one thing we do know is that they're excluding one that we believe is important, and that is the Amtrak. But more importantly is, as I said, the scoping period ended earlier this year, and we have been, and others have been arguing that it needs to be open, and they've assured us, MTA has assured us, that when you individuals or groups right and raise issues, they will add that to what they're looking at. So what I would suggest would be, as soon as you can, I would pen a, a letter making those kinds of suggestions and send it to uh, MTA, send it to Federal Railroad and copy your, your uh, state 
and um, elected officials as well as the governor. And I do the, the county elected officials too. And you're, if you live in a municipality, contact your, your municipal officials too. But whether they add or look at other alternatives is um, really driven by people making suggestions. And at one of their uh, meetings that they, they um, DWRR hosted, they, I don't know whether they were being cavalier or not, but they said, if you think of a better route than these six, this is before they limited it down to three, um, they said, suggest it, we'll look at it. So I'm, I'm not certain they were honest with that, but um, if you make a suggestion and, it's a, and you put it in a letter and send it to them, it's part of the record, and I'll have to respond to that. So, so you know, as far as that is, is concerned, I, there's no real way to force them to look at an alternative, but the best thing you can do is write and make that suggestion. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take the next question right back here. Good. Hi, yes. Alan B. Greenbelt. Um, the Acela train was mentioned and the tracks that already go from uh, D.C. to Baltimore. And you said that that was excluded from the federal contract, but you guys looked at it um, as a viable alternative. Could you talk about that a little bit and, and how we might frame that? Like, like, why don't we go this way if we need more rapid transit to between D.C. and Baltimore? We're happy to. Um, I don't think we wanted to include any additional projects. We just wanted to kill this one. And, um, I don't think, I know I haven't looked at any other opportunities. Thank you, Delegate Gates. Uh, Delegate Gates, while you have the back to real quick, while you have the mic, uh, if, we could, if you could answer the question, because there's been some things out there that have said that the federal government is willing to uh, give $5 billion for the project, and then uh, there's another company willing to give another $5 billion. Can you speak to, can you just speak to, can you speak to that a little bit? Um, sure. Um, what, what we know is they claim, at least this is earlier before, when they only had 40% of their routes were in tunnels, now they're up to about 70%. But back earlier this year, they were talking about about $10 billion to build the route from D.C. to Baltimore. Um, and of that, $5 billion, they said, was coming from the Bank of Japan as a loan. We don't know the terms. We don't know any of the details. Uh, recently, they added that they were looking to get a $5 billion loan from the Federal Railroad uh, Infrastructure Program. And I can tell you, Saturday a week ago, Senator Gordon was shocked when I told him that. Um, so they are looking to borrow money in order to build this, and we believe that the cost is now up to about 17 billion, or we'd use a, we would use a range of 10 to 17. And let me add a couple of things. You know, I told you they want to go from Washington to New York. If you use the, four, uh, of the 40 miles of the existing project, then that translates into a 50 to 80 billion dollar building program. And if they go from Charlotte to Boston, that's 200 to 350 billion dollars to build it. I have no idea where that money is coming from. And our biggest concern, and as these routes drop off, we, we are, our group is very glad that we aren't losing supporters. What I mean by that is the, the route that went to, there were two devastating routes that went through a major part of Bowie and went down to Glen Arden and Glendale and the like. And most of the people that were up in arms over that are still with us because we went from NIMBY when we first looked at it to looking at the economics of this. And we don't believe it will work without heavy subsidies from the government. There are only three operating. There's uh, two in, in uh, Two in, in uh, China, or under construction, two under construction in China. There's one operating in China, one operating in Japan. And all of those are heavily subsidized by their government. And our fear, and what we maintain, is 
if the model is consistent, they will be heavily subsidized here. And guess where the money is going to come from? It's going to come from Amtrak. It's going to come from Metro. It's going to come from the light rail up in Baltimore. It's going to come from interstates, bridges and roads and what have you. So it, it's, you know, we, as an elected official, I had a problem with the governor rating the uh, HUR funds. You remember that issue, right? I mean, I, oh, yes, yes. I mean, oh, no, no, no. But, but, but it's a small, it's a small, it's a small uh, problem, you know, whenever you reduce that. But if you add a new infrastructure that's going to sap away a lot of that money, you're creating a bigger problem that's not necessary without any real benefit. And we also believe that as an alternative, Amtrak's Accela, next generation Accela, if it goes forward, they, they've got a, a plan to implement it in the, next, in the coming decade or so. And if they implement it, they will achieve speeds of about 247 miles an hour, which is comparable to the 311 that Maglev is claiming. And it's already on, for the most part, existing infrastructure. So it has negative or minimal impact on, on the communities it goes to because it's already going through the communities. Thank you. Next question. Uh, I think we have one right in the back. If you can come up a little bit so we can see you. You're kind of under. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Stephanie Werner from Greenbelt. Um, citizens in Greenbelt have worked very, very hard to protect the last remaining woodland area that um, is a fragment of the original Greenbelt of trees that surrounded our town when it was first built. I'm very, very concerned about the impact of the proposed route that would go through that woodland if it were built um, west of the BW Parkway. And I'm wondering if you, Dennis, or anyone else on the panel can speak to exactly what those impacts might be on that woodland area. Um, if anybody has thought about that specifically, how much of the existing trees would be cut down. It looks like it would go through Blueberry Hill, which is a rare pine barrens ecosystem in the state of Maryland. Um, and you know, that area is also a riparian buffer around um, the creek that flows into Indian Creek back there. So there's a lot of ecological impacts. I'm wondering if you can speak to that specifically. Well, the state has a lot of protection uh, programs in place, and it may be in one of the open space programs, or we could definitely look into ways of adding additional protections before uh, Maybe we, that's something we should probably do this, this session, to definitely look at figuring out ways to add additional protections to be sure that they'll have no opportunity to cut down any trees or board any okay. um, next, next question right over here. Hello, Chris Orianda from- oh, I'm sorry, did you want to answer? No, 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 no. Oh. <laughs> yes, thank you. Just one quick question. Sure, go ahead. One second, then. You were asking about what the impact would be to the land. Um, we don't know how many trees that it would take down, but from what I understand, from what I've read, where the tunnel comes out, they would require anywhere from 1 to 1.5 acres of open space to accommodate the tunnel, the infrastructure, uh, whatever you know, supporting equipment they may need access to it. The right of way, according to BWRR, the width of the path that the above ground sections take is 72 feet. So you would have a 70 to 72 foot wide swath of land. Now, you know what they what they do with that afterwards. Who knows? They could they could make a hiking and biking trail, which they. Uh, showed us pictures of and tried to explain to us the synergy that existed between the two. Um, <laughs> that was pretty much the reaction. Uh, you know, so there, there are other considerations, and, and they're, they're letting us know, or they let us know, that the height, the proposed height of the trust on which the trains would ride would be. Uh, I think the bottom part of it would be 18 feet off the ground 
and they are, uh, I believe, 46 feet in width to accommodate the, the, the two, what they call cradles. So that, those are those are the dimensions that are according to what has been given out by the PWR. So I always believe the community is knowing the community is the best. And if there is a very sensitive natural resources that you think are very important to the community and to the environment in general, uh, you should write testimonies and just make sure that people who make decisions know and people who are working on this environmental study know about it because there are different design considerations that can try to mitigate uh, specific impact. Uh, making sure they are aware of this is probably a good way uh, to, to start and it's something you can do right now. So and that's, if I can add too, that's also something that should be considered or written in your letter as well. When you send that letter, we'll consider that that's something that's a fact that you can add in that letter too. I won't go back. I'm going to introduce a couple of elected officials. Uh, Council member uh, from the Carroll Zane Lincoln Lashley is here. I see him in the back. Please give a round of applause. <laughs> and we also have Chris Sander from the 47th District, uh, Victor Ramirez, who's here with us as well. Now to the lovely, lovely, lovely lady right here. Hello again. My name is Crystal Orieva, and I'm from the C Classic area. And my question kind of goes more to what we can do um, to join the fight. Because I know for myself, and I hope I can speak for a lot of people in this room, we want to rally together to see how we can stop it. So when we look at it from a process standpoint, what should we be asking from all the different levels? So when it comes to the power dynamics of the county council, the delegates, the state senators, the governors, knowing and understanding the power that each of those positions have to stop this so we know exactly what we need to be asking from them. And then once the dust settles, who is it that's left holding the bucket, left holding responsible for if this passed? So then we know when we go to the ballot box who we should be keeping and holding accountable for this. Great question. election, you can do that with your vote, but I'm not going to get into politics. Um, the real thing is, this is, this is being driven by the Federal Railroad. It really is. This is, uh, if you go back 20, 25 years ago, uh, there have been a couple of different studies by the federal government about the need to improve the, uh, the tr decrease the transit time, improve the speed between uh, uh, depots, train stations on the East Coast. So this is really uh, driven by the federal. So um, federal railroad is an important component to to, to uh, lobby or to weigh in on, as well as MTA because there's one in the study. Um, we have, are organizing, planning on uh, a lobbying effort with our federal delegation because we need their support because this is being driven by the federal. We also uh, suggest that you, from the governor down, contact and express your position on this uh, and make it clear that you oppose it and why and encourage your elected officials to, uh, to do the right thing, if you will. Now, we have recently learned that uh, one of we're made up by a, a, a very broad and diverse group of, of talent and expertise. One of the persons in, involved in our group is a uh, she has over 20 years in, in doing NEPA studies for clients. She's a contractor. And she was looking into high-speed rail up in New England. And here recently, there was a decision, and we think we can use this. There was a thought to, to it doesn't deal with maglev, it deals with high-speed trains. But they were looking to deviate from the Northeast Corridor up in, in the middle part of Connecticut and go more directly to Boston, going through new communities and what have you. The state of Rhode Island came out and strongly opposed it. The state of Connecticut came out and strongly opposed it. And based on the fact that there was no support from either of the states, they, the Federal Railroad, made the determination 
that any future improvements to high-speed rail in that area of the Northeast Corridor had to use the existing system. We believe that gives us a precedence that if we can get the state of Maryland to oppose this, the Federal Railroad will decide not to do it. So we are adding that to our uh, toolbox, if you will. But we encourage people to lobby their elected officials from the school board, your county council, your municipal official, your state a delegate, state senator, and the governor. Go on record, let them know, and then follow up. That's for them to make sure they're doing the right thing. And that's why elections have consequences. <laughs> All right, um, next question. Right over here, yes. Hi, it's Susan Barnett. I'm also from Greenbelt. And I also am very concerned about the Greenbelt Forest Preserve through which one of the uh, routes is going or proposed to go through. Um, I also just wanted to say, I, I, I may have not prepared well, but I did prepare a little bit. Um, I brought blank postcards addressed to Governor Hogan and also to Councilmember Todd Turner. If you would like to send them a message, I'll be happy to mail it. Um, just find me at the end and um, you can have a postcard to write a message to them. George's County, and I think we're looking at it from a state perspective. 
this would be a state issue, not a not a local issue, but uh, Delegate Hilly and I will be at those hearings and we'll listen um, to what both of those bills do. The asset, I mean, anything, the, oh, the, mm, I don't know what he needs, so, but I think it would be, Right. So, we'll, so what we'll do, I'll, I'll get some more information on that for you. I will also be at that meeting as well, that public hearing. Um, so we'll get that information for you and be able to explain that to you. We do have our public hearing on, I think you said December 5th, uh, for our local bills. Um, the legislative session starts in January, which is a 90-day legislative session where we will hear many of our statewide bills um, in Annapolis, too, that, that we'll invite you to if we see any maglev-related um, bills that might come up, which I'm sure you'll see many of those too. Yeah, but that's that's also, as Delegate uh, Gaines mentioned, that's local, just here in Prince George's County. We do need something that will take a statewide effect as well. Okay? Um, yes, whoever has the microphone. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. And I don't know if this would be to Dr. Zang or whoever would, I'm sorry, I'm Sue Stern from Greenbelt. And I have a question regarding environmental impact because they have determined how birds use the magnetic field angle for their navigation. And so, you know, in addition to the forest preserve, I wonder if there's been any investigation for the impact, impact of migration on the birds and then also even the rare, um, the rare elements of neodymium the neom, I guess. I don't know if you've had any investigation because it depends on certain rare earth metals, I understand. And one of five critically rare elements is neodymium, um, and that would deplete it. I didn't know whether there was any research on these environmental impacts. Thank you. So, so in terms of the electromagnetic field strength, um, I, I can share some of the data observations from previous operating, you know, the systems that are um, in operation right now. So the typical electromagnetic field strength is about twice as the static Earth magnetic field strength. Then in terms of impact on human beings, uh, it's actually less than uh, the, t the TV, much less than what the TV gives. Uh, us in general, but in terms of its impact on um, birds that actually sense, that use very dedicated uh, organs to sense the earth magnetic fields for migration, I think that's a great PhD research topic for some students in the University of Maryland, but I'm not aware of, of any existing study on that, but that seems to be a legitimate concern. Uh, then I'll pass on to These are the kind of questions we've been raising and asking and not getting any answers. And I can tell you that I uh, was contacted uh, by a friend of mine who's with the Sierra Club about their uh, their own membership and wanting them to take a position on this. And I reached out previously and asked if there was somebody at their national that could look at the environmental. So we we're looking at that and any other environmental groups that they can come on board and advise us. You know, we're looking for that kind of information. It's beyond our expertise right now. Uh, but if I could go back to the issue about publicity and what have you, if you don't mind my drifting back. Uh, we reached out to the press on numerous occasions and basically it's not in their agenda right now, not on their agenda right now. But interestingly enough, um, if citizens contact the radio station or newspaper, what have you, and say this is an issue, and I kid you not, this has actually happened. Um, they had, uh, WBAL in Baltimore had um, Wayne Rogers, who's the, the executive of BWRR, on for about a 10 minute interview, and people called in and said, well, why don't you talk to somebody opposed to it? And they said, well, who should we talk to? So they contacted me and I agreed, and I had a five minute interview on here because they reached out to us. So. And I just got contacted uh, by Washington Post reporter. She took a lot of information two weeks ago. She was out of town to do the Thanksgiving holiday and she's supposed to call me this week to do a follow-up because she wants to do a big story 
uh, on this issue coming forward. So we're now starting to see some of the press in the area coming forward. But you know, we've reached out. Uh, we had, after the Bowie State, we had a local news conference. We invited the press and no one showed. Only the Bowie Blade News showed up for our press conference. And this was at the, this was at the request of Senator Doug Peters. Um, so a little bit higher up than, than ours, but it, it been a challenge for us to get out the word to the media, but when citizens seem to, or it seems to when citizens contact the media, they're more than happy to start searching out us and, and or any opponent to this issue. Uh, quick comment. Hello, my comment. Back to the historical properties. We have, and we're going to be posting these fairly soon, both on our Stop This Trade Out Work website and on our Facebook page. Sample letters that someone who is a member of a historic society or someone who owns a historic property or someone who is interested in the preservation of historic properties, you can download these sample letters. Obviously, you'll need to fill in the personal information, but all that is going to be there. And here's another, you know, and that letter can be sent to MTA. It can be sent to the governor. But if you send it to the MTA and you request of them that you be included as a consultant in the NEPA process specific to the preservation of historic properties, they have to consider you to be a consultant. If you're a consultant, that gives you access to all the paperwork and documents that have gone back and forth specific to that portion of the study. So, can, so can organizations do that, or it has to be well? Uh, historic societies can do it. If you live in a farmhouse that is on the National Historic Registry, you can do that. So, one of the things that we're doing is we've identified, you know, up and down the line. These are the historic societies. We know the historic properties. We have everything of historical significance, all the conservation easements, forest easements, land easements. Okay. I, I believe so. You, 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 I know you guys are whispering. You can't hear you just saying. No, real, real quick, like as an example, all of Friendship Heights is, is considered historic properties or has a historic designation of some form. And we were going to, our group was going to reach out to them because we thought it was small numbers. Then we found out that every house here is a little, was beyond, a little beyond our direct outreach, but we're trying to come up with a way to kind of go through maybe the Forest Heights government to get the information out there and anywhere else. But you can either be a member of a group, owner of a property, or just interested in this property and you can write and request to be a consultant. Thank you. It, it, she said, can it be a town council? It, yes, it can be. Yes. Uh, Mr. Greenville. Hi there. My name is Paul Downs. I'm from Greenville, and I asked Dennis Bradley, how did Bowie residents' resistance to the Maglev keep its citizens engaged in the battle? How do you maintain keeping the heat on? How do you get 700 plus supporters for your movement? I'm just asking, how, how, do you, how do you keep the resistance? How do you keep the citizens in Bowie involved in, in, in so Bowie? You know, I, I think this question is, he wanted, wants you to talk about or elaborate on your success that you've had in Bowie to remove the lines from Bowie to other places. That's well, essentially what the question I, I don't think we moved the lines from Bowie to other places. We, we, were successful, we were successful in getting at least the two worst case line that went to Bowie removed. And I think indirectly they have acknowledged the fact that it was through our lobbying and through our, our outreach, what have you, uh, that that was the reason that it occurred. They acknowledged that. Um, and, and earlier I, I commented about the fact that we went from being NIMBY to looking at this as a serious pocketbook issue. And we, we are pleasantly surprised by a lot of the people who were in the, the crosshairs of where the routes were originally proposed who were no longer affected. 
they are still on board with us because they accept or they agree with us that it's a economic issue. It's not, it's not going to be beneficial to the communities it goes to. There are three stops, DC, BWI, Baltimore. So it's not going to help commuters. It's not going to help uh, the, get really a lot of cars off the, the road to ease congestion, although that's what they're pinning it on. But it will be heavily subsidized. And if that happens, then it's money out of your pocket because your tax dollars are going to go pay for it. So it's that message that we've shifted from NIMBY to it's not, the technology isn't doable. It's questionable from the economics. It has uncertainty when it comes to environmental issues that that's kept people rallying around. And how we keep the message is by having meetings like this. We will go to any group and speak before any group on this issue if you want us to. And through that, we keep it, it moving. And the last point I'll make is when you talk to your neighbors, tell them about it because there's a good chance that your neighbor may not know about this. And if they don't know about them, tell them about our webpage, tell them about our Facebook page, educate them, and then encourage them to write the letters. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually Daniel Galaros, uh, chair of the vice chair of the county council to come up while she's coming up. I'm actually Chuck Lady to ask you a question. My name is Erica Jones from Greenville. Move your mic up so we can call you. My name is Erica Jones from Greenville. Most, if not all, the conversation tonight has been about the BWRR Bangalore project, but the package we received tonight also mentions the Elon Musk project, and the materials we were given says that Governor Hogan gave them a conditional utility permit to begin digging. So what, if this is for Mr. Boone or Mr. Brady, what are the differences between these projects and the state's involvement with each of them? I don't think anyone from the General Assembly knows. And as I said, uh, at the beginning of the session, we're gonna have a couple hearings, uh, uh, transportation hearings to identify what those projects are and what type of state involvement they'll have. What they're saying is that it's not gonna cost any state dollars, but it will take state assets away. It'll be on state land. So my belief is that the General Assembly should have some input on that. Thank you. Uh, Councilman McLaughlin. Thank you, Senator Washington. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so County Council Member Danielle Gueros, also serves as the Vice Chair for the County Council. Uh, so just a little bit of the council, and I really want to thank our panel for being here. It's been helpful to hear from you, and I really want to uh, especially thank Dennis Brady, who has been out in my district, in District 3, uh, particularly working with our Beacon Heights community. Um, all three of the latest alignments will go through the Beacon Heights, Woodlawn, Glenridge community, um, so they're affected by all three of the alignments being proposed. Uh, so the County Council um, has gotten a little bit of a briefing on this. It's been a little bit um, hit and miss, um, which is to say that uh, we have heard a little bit from BWRR on it, um, but very little from uh, the Governor's Office and from the State Department of Transportation. Very similar to what you heard earlier from Delegate Washington and others on it. Um, in fact, uh, BWRR did a briefing with the County Council now probably about six weeks to seven weeks ago. Um, it is available online. All of our council sessions and work sessions are streamed so you can go back and find it. Um, Mr. Brady was there and, and spoke at it. And I think he would agree with me that the County Council has a lot of concerns, deep concerns about the project, exactly like all of you here in the audience. Um, and there was a, quite a lot of commentary from all of my colleagues uh, with questions that came up. Uh, we are looking to see, uh, we know that there's some local bills that our delegation is taking a look at. And as was mentioned by Delegate Gaines, we think there's gonna be a lot of conversations both about the Hyperloop and Maglev. Um, eventually the Hyperloop also needs to get to DC, and if y'all do a little bit of a straight line or a slight curve, you know that also means it has to go almost on the same alignments that are being proposed by the Maglev project. So we have severe concerns about what that tunneling means for our community, how communities get a say in these types of very big projects in their community. And all of that I know the delegation is, is taking a look at already with some of the local bills. And we're, we're, we're really glad to, to see that and to partner with the delegation. Um, a lot of my colleagues, I know Councilmember Layman was here earlier and she had to head out. 
Um, many of them have been at the meetings by the state, Councilmember Turner and Councilmember Lehman and myself, as well as Councilmember Harrison, are probably the council members that have been the most active on the project, in, mainly because it's our communities that we represent who have been affected through all of the alignments. So all of those council members have been attending some of the state meetings um, and trying as best as possible to keep informed of the project. Our latest conversation with the state was actually just about three weeks ago. Um, Delegate Gaines was there and Delegate Healy. Um, it's a, uh, what we currently, what we typically call the road show, which is to say the state comes out to every county in Maryland and presents its projects that it will be doing um, in the state of Maryland and in the jurisdiction. And it's our opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, in this case, with the Deputy Secretary for the Maryland Department of Transportation. I would also say that there was a lot of conversation about Maglev at that meeting as well. He definitely got an earful both from the council members and from the delegates with concerns. I will also say that uh, the Deputy Secretary did go on the record, interestingly enough, at that point, and we can go back to that segment because it is taped. Um, he did go on the record saying this would eventually need state money. Um, and that's an interesting point because that actually has been highly debated and I think the advocates of the project have very much implied that actually it would be private funded. Um, the key actually officially on the record indicated that it would need additional state dollars um, for this project to move forward. Uh, so we're once again on behalf of the County Council, we are very closely following the project. We are your advocates. If I could just mention one point, and as someone who has the Purple Line project heavily in our district and went through the EIS process pretty significantly like the rest of the 22nd delegation, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is that every comment you made here tonight or every question you have gets to be part of a process. You must become part of the record. If I learned anything from the opposition on the Purple Line, and every moment they dragged that project out, and they dragged it out, and they're still trying to drag it out. Uh, the record matters, the statements at this point matter, the evaluation matters that we are all engaged in, and so this moment matters for you to weigh in on, and when the report comes out, and that 30 day or 45 day, whatever that window is for comments, you must comment at that point in time. Talk personally about what this project means to you, what it means to the community, the things you still want to evaluate that you haven't seen evaluated. Those comments really do matter, um, and they will matter as this project moves forward. So please make sure you weigh in. There were some great questions that were asked here tonight. Uh, please make sure that you are putting those in as a formal part of the record. So thank you. Thank you. All right, so we'll get to three more questions. We're going to go here, and I know I see this young lady's hand up for a while. I'm going to go back over here uh, for the last question, okay? Yes. Good evening. Uh, my name is Nidio Castro. I'm in the Woodland um, area, which is close to Beacon High and Greenwich. And um, I'm very concerned that the citizens there, uh, there is a high population of Latinos that um, do not speak the language. So I have taken up on me to do an email in Spanish and I translate a lot of material in Spanish to pass it out. But as you see, I just want to be sure. So in next door, every time somebody posted something, I try to translate it. Um, I think, creo que hay alguien que habla español aquí. Somebody speaks Spanish? Alguien habla español? Okay. So I'm, I'm hoping that they're getting everything, but si tiene alguna pregunta cuando termine me pueden ver. If anybody has a questions at the end, they can see me. I have information in Spanish. I have also established an email account where you can connect with me and we can talk about the alignment and everything because I have been at least in five meetings about this. So I'm, I'm learning more and more. And uh, I'm a little concerned because there's a lot of disabled people in the neighborhood, their homes, so people that can really get out to know about what's going on. Um, so I, I would just want to help. Thank you very much. And you have been very helpful. Uh, um, something that we have on our Facebook page, if you go to the Facebook page, go to files, there is a uh, three-page document that we have translated into Spanish, and it, it gives uh, a lot of information. Um, do you have it? Okay, so you know about that. Okay, 
So you're, you're, you're doing She's involved. She's involved. <laughs> <laughs> she knows it. She knows it. Uh, yes, right here. Hi there. My name is Melissa Ayer. I come from Greenville, Maryland. Um, I have a question about imminent domain. So, uh, Delegate Gaines, you spoke about homes as, a, as imminent domain. The Greenbelt Forest Preserve, as some of us understand it, was purchased with program open space dollars, for which we are grateful that have been recently restored due to bipartisan uh, legislation at the state, um, as well as land and water conservation funds. So, um, what, in, in that instance, I understand that there is um, traditionally for program open space funds, for the municipalities to revert or convert that land, they have to sort of take that, you know, it, the, the equation is very much about the municipality converting that land to, or the local governance to convert that land to a different use and then offset it with sort of a similar use. But I don't understand, I guess that's my question for you, which is if the state takes that land as eminent domain when it's been protected by program open space dollars, for federal dollars, what does that what does that mean, and what what opportunity do we have as citizens to to sort of suggest that that's improper? So we're going to ask uh, Delegate Haley to chime in on this one. Delegate, you want to take that? Well, I've been doing a lot of research on the whole question of eminent domain. With your question specifically about program open space, I'm sure that Delegate Tawana Gaines, because that's in the her purview in her committee. Uh, all of that, uh, that's, a, that's a specific kind of question. But in general, um, this whole issue with the damage in the main and, and the Baltimore Washington Parkway, which is called a federal parkway, but that's a federal, the whole parkway is supposed to be a park for the road to it. And all these things that are being proposed right now by the governor, Maglev is the, the first one that we've heard about. The Elon Musk project, the the hyperloop that you talked about earlier, uh, they, uh, the Public Service Commission gave them the right to start to dig. They're not, they're digging to, it's a very questionable way they phrased it because they would say, well, they were just moving utilities so that they could dig. But then the governor said, well, they are digging. And there are no environmental studies being done on that at all. And which makes a lot of people think it's not serious, it's just talk. But we cannot afford to let that be us listening to that, saying that it's just talk. We have to take it seriously because it's, it could be serious. And so that's one part of it. The other part of it about the whole issue, eminent domain is that the utilities already have it. The Public Service Commission can say, if they need to lay wires or, or, or pipeline for gas, that kind of thing, the Public Service Commission controls that. And the, in that odd place in the law, a railroad company is considered a utility under that. And that's what my legislation is gonna address in the coming session, uh, is dealing with that whole issue. It is very complicated. And we do have to, you're right, we have to talk to the federal government about a lot of this because they own most of that land. The right of way on both sides is the right of way of the Baltimore Washington Parkway, which is a federal right of way. If the federal government wants to do this, there's a lot of, there's not a whole lot of things that the state can do to stop the federal government except what you're doing by coming out here tonight, letting your Congress and your U.S. Senators know let the Federal Railroad Administration know that this is something that this community is not interested in hosting and will continue to resist. And when it comes to program open space, usually if, if uh, property is purchased with a program open space, it's there forever. Um, I have seen a couple of bills in the past where people have purchased land with using uh, program open space and they try to figure out a way to get out of it, but we've always, as an assembly, said no. Yes, it's the state of Maryland, you know. It's, it's, it's my role as a 
member of the assembly when I say, you know, it's the state that says no, and, and they, we have never said yes. Okay, thank you very much for that question and those answers. Yes, ma'am, for our very last question. Hi, my name is Emily, I'm from Woodlawn area. <laughs> um, my question is, we've talked a lot about historical property and open property. What about our private properties? We, a lot of us don't live in historical homes, so we might just lose our house and have to move. Are they gonna pay our mortgages off? Um, a lot of our houses are valued way less than what we bought them for. Where does that money come from? Are, are banks gonna forgive a loan? How does that work? The state would have to buy you out at a fair market rate. You know, whoever owns the pro project would have to uh, more than likely buy you out then. Hopefully that won't happen. Yeah. So do we all come together and determine what fair is, or is it on an individual basis? It's done through an appraisal. So each property will be appraised if the state has an interest in it. That's what they did, uh, I think, on Riverdale Road when the Purple Line was coming in. Our goal is to never get to that point, period, uh, to make sure that we don't get there at all. Um, so that's why we're here today. And so I've got to really thank uh, my panelists today for being here. Can you give them a round of applause, please? Uh, state's absence. Um, I want to thank you all also for being here, uh, for taking your time out to learn a little bit more about this. Um, this won't be the last meeting that we have. Um, I have uh, table talk sessions that I host uh, throughout this session back here in the community, and we're going to constantly invite BWRR, MTA, and the like to those meetings to come and hear you directly. Uh, but we, we encourage you to put your, as, the, as as Councilman Glero said earlier, put it in writing, become a person of record. Um, you, have a, you have a flyer or some packet from my office uh, stating how you can write that letter and what should be included in that letter. Um, take that home and review it and, and send it in. You can even send it back to me and ask me is this adequate and we can take a look at it and, and help you out with it as well. Um, you'll, get an email, you'll get another email from us, thank you for being here, but also some sample letters that we've seen other folks send out, so we have those opportunities as well. Um, but thank you for being here, and if you have any other questions, we'll be here to answer your questions on this slide. So thank you for being here. Okay, let's, let's, let's go quickly. Fo fo follow up on his comment. On our Facebook page, we've generated a contact sheet that starts with your senator, your federal senator and, and congressman, it's got the governor. It, it's, it's set up to where if you click on the hyperlink, it'll automatically open up email to start talking to that person. So we've done it by community, whether you're in a municipality or whether you're in a, in a unincorporated area, we've got that. So it, it is available to everyone that was impacted by the original six, we bluffed it up. And then last thing, Sure, we have in the back, you see somebody stopped the maglev train. Uh, we have a sign back there, we're selling them at cost. Um, we fronted them up front and we're just selling them to recoup the cost. We're not making any profit out of it. So that they're $5, uh, we would appreciate the support. Thank you. Thank you. Secondly, save this date, because I just got confirmation uh, yesterday. We are going to have a rally at the Lawyers Ball, February 15th, in Annapolis, February 15th from 6 to 8 to protest the Maglev. So we'll push that out, but we've, we've just got the confirmation. We've got the permit approved, and we're getting ready to plan it. This third Thursday in February, 
February 15th, 6 to 8, Lawyers Mall. Be there so you can demonstrate and show your support, your opposition to this. Thank you very much. Everybody have a good night and a safe ride home. Thank you.